The late Murray Rothbard is in many ways the godfather of the modern libertarian movement, starting with the publication of his great track, Man, Economy, and State, back in 1962. And of course, Rothbard played an instrumental role in helping Lou Rockwell get the Mises Institute off the ground. So to honor Murray, we're holding an event at the upcoming Students for Liberty Conference in Washington, D.C., and the event's called Why Rothbard Matters. It'll be a cocktail reception on the evening of Saturday, February 27th. And in the meantime, this weekend's show features a great panel discussion about Murray, not just the economist and the intellectual scholar, but also Murray the man. The panel features our own David Gordon, Walter Block, and Joe Salerno, all three of whom worked with Murray and knew him personally for many, many years prior to his death in the early 1990s. So if you're a fan of Rothbard, I guarantee you will enjoy this freewheeling panel discussion of what Murray was like, not just as an intellectual and as a scholar, but also as a person. Stay tuned for a great panel discussion on Murray Rothbard. I think uh, when you met Murray Rothbard, the first thing would uh, impress people was that he knew everything. He really did. Uh, I often used to go, and the way he was able to know everything was he had an amazing ability to read uh, very fast and absorb all the material. In that way, he was like his teacher, Joseph Dorfman, the one he'd gotten his PhD with at Columbia. I often used to go to bookstores with him. For example, one we liked were in uh, Manhattan, where the Strand Bookstore was his favorite, and there were ones in uh, the Bay Area that he liked to go to. And he would go into the bookstore, and he could go down the shelves, and he would read every book and he would be able to say oh, what was in this one, what was in that one. He, he would do no matter, no matter what the subject, he had an amazing range of reference. He would just know everything. I'll give you a few illustrations. Uh, some of you may know that uh, there was a libertarian philosopher, very famous one, Robert Nozick, that he didn't get along with all that well, but the reason, the reason they initially didn't get along very well was that they had, when Nozick met Rothbard, they had a big argument about whether you could measure utility. And Nozick took the point of view that you could, and Rothbard didn't. And if you look, uh, Rothbard knew all the philosophical literature on this topic, not just the economics, for example. He not only knew Carl Hempel's work, but there was an unpublished part of the Hempel's book that he was able to refer to. So this uh, gave him, it was very hard to ask him something that he didn't know. Uh, I remember once I like uh, history trivia questions, and I was telling Murray that I had a conversation with Mel Bradford, who was an outstanding scholar that we both knew, and I was able to, uh, he, uh, Bradford really knew American history extremely well, but I was able to give Bradford a question he didn't know, which was, what was Rutherford Hayes's middle name? So I was telling uh, Murray about that, and he said, ah, it was Burchard, of course. <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, he didn't know just economics and philosophy and political theory, but he was very interested in, uh, in art history. His specialty was German Baroque churches, and it turned out he'd been friends. He'd known in the 1940s uh, Leo Steinberg, who became one of the great uh, art historians, a specialist in the Re- Renaissance. He was very, very much interested in Leo Steinberg's work on art history. So many things that uh, Murray didn't didn't, uh, publish about. He knew a lot about. If you just read his published works, you just get a a small idea of the range of his knowledge. Uh, Another example comes to mind. In 1980, there was a conference at uh, Albany held in honor of Thomas Saas. So Murray gave a paper on psychohistory, which was the the use of psychoanalysis in uh, 
trying to understand history. Murray was very critical of it. And he was able to absorb all the literature on psychoanalysis. He, was, he knew all the books critical of Freud. He had a complete bibliography of that. So again, any topic you were to ask him, he would, he would know an enormous about, about. Now, in addition to his wide range of knowledge, he had a tremendous analytical mind. If you gave him an argument, he would see instantly what was wrong with it, what were the uh, flaws in it. He would know all sorts of references that could be cited about it. Uh, I can't really think of anyone that I've met who could really match him in the quickness and sharpness of his intellect. And he certainly, of the people I've met, he's the one who influenced me the most. He and his wonderful wife, Joey, were very kind to me, and he, uh, I'll never forget what they did for me. I should tell you also that uh, Murray was interested not only in, uh, in information scholarship, but he had a very keen interest in people. For example, at the Mises University programs that we had when he was, uh, he was here and he was teaching them, he would be very interested in what all the students were doing. Uh, I remember on one occasion I was sitting with him. At that time when we had them at Stanford, everyone would go to all the lectures. And I was sitting with him and we were making notes. And uh, a, a woman came up who was in the class and said, uh, you seem to be having a good time during the lecture. And what we didn't tell her was we were making lists of which student should be kicked out of the <laughs> program. <laughs> uh, another time, uh, uh, Murray was, I was telling Murray about some item about, he was very interested in about concerned uh, some item, something had been going on. He really, he really wanted to know. He, 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 I was talking to him about this. It was sort of a very confidential item. It was, as they say, hot gossip item. So a student came up and was sort of standing there while we were talking. Murray looked around and said, can't you see we're busy? <laughs> and he, he wanted to know what everybody was doing about everything. And he, he really was a wonderful person, I don't think. Uh, I'd ever meet anyone as uh, great as he was, and I'm very fortunate to have known him. Thank you. The big problem I had with Murray Rothbard was stomach cramps. <laughs> he was so funny. He just had me in stitches for hours. I almost died of stomach something or other. I mean, he was just hilarious, making fun of everybody and Bill Buckley, and, you know, it, he was just... He was horrible. <laughs> Just, <yeah. laughs> uh, he was the sort of person that my parents warned me against. Uh, he would drink alcohol, and uh, he would uh, maybe smoke, and he would stay up late. He'd stay up till five in the morning, and you know all these bad things. It was just uh, very bad. Murray would just cackle like a banshee about playing Risk, and he would say, you know, we anarchists are the only ones who can play Risk, which is the idea you take over the world, uh, uh, where nobody else, everyone else wanted to take over the world. We didn't, so we could sort of play it honestly. <laughs> uh, one of the most admirable things about Murray is the way he treated Hans Hoppe. Murray grounded um, uh, libertarianism in natural law, natural rights, and along comes this punk kid, Hans. And I, I, uh, Murray is 15 years older than me, and Hans is maybe 10 years younger. So Murray's like 25 years older than Hans. And maybe Murray was 50 and Hans was 25. I forget the exact uh, years. And Hans came along with this much better grounding of libertarianism in Murray's view, uh, the argument from argument. And usually what happens is when you're the leader of, of a group, like Murray was, and some kid comes along and, and does you better, what you do is, you, like if, if somebody ever tried this on Ayn Rand, you'd kick him right out. Uh, and Murray embraced this. And, and to me, this was one of the, uh, sort of an indication of where he was at, where he was coming from. He was after the truth. And if Hans did something better than him, uh, he acknowledged that and thanked Hans and uh, uh, supported Hans. Uh, when I first started writing my writing career, I would keep track of how many uh, words 
per day I could do. And I would keep a track in terms of number of pages, and each page had around 300 words. So if I did five pages a day, that was pretty good, 1,500 words. And every once in, most days I wouldn't do uh, five pages, but every once in a while I'd do, most, uh, sometimes I would do five, and sometimes 10, sometimes 15. One day, I got up really early at eight in the morning, and I worked until two of the next morning, and I did uh, 23 pages. Uh, which was way more than anything I had ever done. So I'm, you know, feeling macho, and I'm going to compare myself with a man. I would never compare myself about quality. I mean, that's sort of like my chess against Bobby Fischer's chess. I'm just talking about quantity. So I call Murray, and I said, well, how many uh, pages can you do in a day? And he goes, meh, meh, who keeps track of that? <laughs> and, but I pressed. I was uh, sort of pushy, and though, well, I still am now. <laughs> so, shut up. <laughs> It's true, but, um, you know, <laughs> so uh, finally Murray says, eight pages an hour. <laughs> eight pages an hour? I mean, so my whole day of 23 pages was roughly three of his hours. And, you know, a good typist who does 100 words a minute could beat Murray uh, in terms of typing, eight pages an hour. But, I mean, Murray is typing on a, on a typewriter, none of these computer things, and uh, you know, and it, it's just original work. I remember one time Murray was, uh, we were sitting around in the living room and uh, Murray was saying, well, he has to prepare this paper for, you know, two weeks from now. And Joey says, what? Two weeks from now? You have to do it tomorrow. So Murray disappears into his office for uh, an hour or two and he comes out with 12 pages or something like that. It, it's really, he was just uh, phenomenal. Um, when I... Uh, I, I was born in Brooklyn. I was a, a track teammate in high school of Bernie Sanders. My views on uh, economics were roughly like his views then. I went through an Ayn Rand phase, and then I was a, a minarchist, like Ayn Rand. And then um, Larry Moss and Jerry Wallows, his roommate, tried to convince me to meet Murray Rothbard, and the attraction was that Murray was an anarchist, so I didn't want to meet him, because he was, you know, an anarchist is crazy. You can't be an anarchist, you know, that, that's just chaos and, and, and weirdness. So I didn't want to meet Murray. And finally, the two of them ganged up on me and uh, prevailed upon me to meet with Murray, and he converted me into... Uh, anarchism in about five minutes. I mean, it was the, the fastest uh, conversion ever, I think. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but uh, he just sort of used my arguments that I got from Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson uh, about uh, uh, market failure and um, uh, if you do well, you prosper, and if you do badly, uh, you lose out. And he just applied it to the government, which I had never thought to do. The uh, he just really wanted to be my friend. And I could never understand that because I'd read Man Economy and Stayed All during the day and then at night I'd go to his uh, dinner parties. And what would a, a genius like that want to do with me? Uh, and the only way I could be worthy of him was be to argue with him. So I would you know, just say, well, on page 202, this is a mistake. And he was just, I was a real pain in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> And he was so nice. Uh, he had a picture of Mises on his wall, and I said, how could you have a picture of Mises on your wall? Mises wasn't an anarchist. And Murray just sort of smiled at me and said, well, you know, read Mises, you'll, you'll find it. He was so gentle and so kind to me, and I was such a pain in the neck. And I'm glad he was tolerant of me, and I try to be tolerant of my students to pass on the baton that uh, Murray passed on to me. I have one distinction that I think no one else on this planet has, and that I think I'm the only co-author with Murray on anything. Virtually everything that Murray wrote, he wrote as a single author, and one thing he and I are the co-author. This was when I was the associate editor of the Review of Austrian Economics, which was the predecessor to the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, of which Joe Salerno is now editor. I wanted to mention something about Joe. There was this uh, debate. Uh, when did the modern Austrian revival start? Was it in 1973 with the South Royalton thing? Uh, and then Hayek's Nobel Prize around that time. And uh, the South Royalton thing, you had three speakers. You had Murray, Izzy Kirzner, and um, Ludwig Lachmann. And there must have been, oh, 40 or so of, of us, uh, 30. Uh, 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 Roger was there, I think Joe was there, and, and 30 other people in their 30s uh, like me. And Joe made the point, well, if the revival of modern Austrian economics started in 1973, how did you get 30 young people uh, to attend this thing? 
And uh, Joe quite clearly says, and I think very accurately, that it wasn't in 1973 started, it was in 1962, which was the publication of Man, Economy, and State. So I, I think that um, Murray's, that book uh, w was really uh, the key element of the, uh, of the start. Um, I remember one time, uh, I have a friend, Michael Edelstein, and he is a mentor, uh, uh, Albert Ellis, the therapist, is a mentor of my friend, Michael Edelstein, and me and Michael and Murray went over to Albert Ellis's house and we sung rational songs. It was sort of one of the highlights in, in my, uh, my career. Um, I, I have uh, so many, many other stories to tell about Murray. Uh, I... I regard him as a friend. He regarded me as a friend. I, I'm honored in that. I, I think he is the, um, the the second best economist in the history of the universe, second to Mises, uh, and he is certainly the, the first best libertarian and theor historian and uh, uh, he uh, philosopher, I mean, he, uh, sociologist. He uh, was a real Renaissance person. I'm honored to have known Murray, uh, my dear friend. I like Robert Higgs still more and Murray to this day. Uh, I, I came across his name uh, for, uh, in, 19, in uh, my junior year in, in um, college. I read a, an article in the New York Times uh, Sunday magazine in which uh, it mentioned, happened to mention that Murray Rothbard was the leader of the libertarian movement in the US and also was an Austrian economist. And I had heard the term Austrian economist in my history of economic thought class. So I, was, and I thought it was simply a closed chapter of economic thought. Uh, well, I mentioned this to some of uh, the people I hung around with at the uh, Young Americans for Freedom. There was sort of a libertarian wing and, and then there were some conservatives. And one of the people handed me a little booklet. Uh, I was an economic major at the time uh, and it was uh, this booklet, Economic Depressions, Their Cause and Cure, but it was in the form of a, a, what was called a, a Bramble mini book. I think it was uh, published by the Constitutional Alliance in Michigan. But anyway, it was about a third of the size. It was literally a, a, a mini book. It was very small. So I read it right away, and um, it took about 45 minutes to read. And it completely changed my intellectual outlook. I, I learned more from that book uh, in, in those 45 minutes, and I had in two and a half years of sitting through you know, dull, dreary, dismal courses on, on macroeconomics and the principles of macroeconomics and, and fiscal policy. Uh, so that, that was the point at which I, I, I first became familiar with Murray Rothbard. I then was, uh, when I went to graduate school, I was elected vice president of the um, New Jersey Libertarian Party. And so my, myself and the president heard that Murray Rothbard was speaking over in New York at a, at a, con at a libertarian conference. So I went over to, we went to see him and I was very excited. And by, in, in the meantime, between reading the small mini book uh, and, and going to the conference, I had read most of his other things. So I had in my mind, of course, an image of him as a very scholarly and grave presence. Uh, and when we got there, and he, it was his turn to speak, this, this short, jolly, well, actually joyous guy just bounded up onto the stage and says, you know, I just came back from Europe and I'm glad I'm here. He says, I can say the word anarchist without being hooted down. Uh, and so uh, one thing that stood out in my memory was that the, the speaker before Murray Rothbard was Robert Lefebvre, who uh, was uh, a pacifist as well as a libertarian and didn't even believe in, in self-defense against violence. So at the end of Murray's talk, someone raised their hand and said, well, do you accept Lefebvre's, Lefebvre's position? And so Mur Murray, who always was great at, at um, giving you examples, instead of answering the question directly, he said, well if, well, if somebody was across the room with a mallet and was coming at me, I'd plug him. <laughs> so so I, this guy's great. I mean, you know, he, he's just a wonderful personality as well as a, um, a great, great scholar. Uh, so a, a few months later, uh, I decided as the vice president of the Libertarian Party in New Jersey to have him speak at our, our convention. And so he was, you know, and I, I called him up and I told him that we didn't really have much money and so on. And so I was going to try to bargain him down to $100 to come across the river to New Jersey. But he says, well, I'll do it for $75. 
And I said, fine, that's great. So he came and, and um, some, some people, I think, yeah, someone, he didn't drive. Um, or he only, he, as he said to me, he says, I formally drive. I have a license, but I really, I don't drive. So he came over and uh, so we were talking and I happened to mention that I was a graduate student in economics at Rutgers University. And um, he immediately, we were talking about something else. He immediately stopped and he, 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 he was overjoyed. So he started looking around for a pen or pencil to write my name down. So I gave him a pen, he wrote my name down. He said, I'll have people get in touch with you on Monday. I don't know what that meant, but <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, but sure enough, on Monday, somebody called me up and said that uh, well, we heard from our Rothbard that you're a, a good Austrian and that, that uh, you know, we want you to join our reading group. And I did. I joined the reading group, and we were, I, Walter was in it, actually, Richard Fink and, and a few others. And uh, so, at, so I guess there were reports back to Murray by members of the group that I was good. So at some point... I was asked to come to Murray's apartment, and I, I, you know, like Roger, I was very, very uh, afraid. Uh, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I knew he was jolly and pleasant and everything, but I didn't know how it would be one on one. And, and basically, he was he was vetting me to see to see how hardcore I was. So I, Richard Fink drove me over there. I I went to his uh, apartment, and we were in a living room, and it was you know, midnight, one o'clock. We were still discussing things. So he asked me about the looter question, so, you know, because uh, the riots had occurred in 67, 68. And his position was that, um, you, you, you know, if, if a looter's coming into your store, you can shoot them. Um, but if they, ha if they take your property and they're running down the street, then you have to resort to the police or, you know, you, you can't shoot them in the back. I said, why not? He goes, ah, he says, I never thought of that. So, so you know, he says, ah, you're someone I can have a conversation with. <laughs> So I think I think I passed the audition, you know, with, with that with that answer. Um, and so that was uh, right before South Royalton. Then I got an invitation to South Royalton, and uh, as uh, Walter sort of covered South Royalton. But at the time, I I, I saw you know Murray Rothbard and Israel Kurzer and, and, and Ludwig Lachmann. I had read their works by then, and I, I you know I was very you know in awe of all of them. But when I thought more about it, I think Lou Rockwell had asked me to give a talk about man, economy, and state sometime in the 1980s, and I thought about it, and, and, it, and it struck me that, as Walter pointed out, in 1974, when we, we had the, the uh, conference at South Royalton, which was the first North American Austrian conference, uh, that all these young people showed up, young PhDs, graduate students like myself, and so on. And, and I said, well, where do they all come from? I mean, what, they, you know, it wasn't like a field of dreams. If you hold it, they will come. I mean, it <laughs> didn't happen like that. It wasn't a big bang. It wasn't a big bang. But then, then I look back, and it wasn't only man, economy, and state, but, but Rothbard had written America's Great Depression, What Has Government Done to Our Money, uh, Power and Market, and For New Liberty, all within the, between 1962 and, and, and 1973. And... To a, to a man or to a man and woman, because there was a, Karen Vaughan was there, a woman, uh, everyone, everyone there was really a Rothbardian at that point. He was the, the main reason uh, behind the, the revival of Austrian economics. Uh, I just want to say a few other things. Uh, one, one of the greatest memories I have of Murray was meeting him at his favorite delicatessen in... Um, in New York, a Wolf's Delicatessen on the corner of 46th Street and 5th Avenue, a Jewish deli that just has great food, uh, and uh, you know, he loved. And uh, uh, but we, during the so we would meet there maybe a few times a year, three times a year, four times a year. Um, he was teaching at Brooklyn Poly. I was teaching at Pace University in New York City. Uh, but in the 1990s, he was teaching at uh, Las Vegas, but he'd come back. Uh, in the summers, and so we were meeting while he was writing his history of economic thought, and he we would talk and you know exchange pleasantries, and then he would tell me about the new things he was finding in in the history of economic thought, and how this guy was really a bad guy, and how this guy who he thought was a bad guy was actually a good guy, how this guy had deviations, and so on and so forth, and it was great. And he would go on, and then he'd stop, and he'd say, oh, "I'm so sorry," he says, "You know, I haven't let you talk. Do you want to talk?" He was giving me a private seminar. I mean, it was the greatest thing that, you know, he would think that I wouldn't want to hear him more. I mean, he was, he was really a humble seeker of truth. And I, and I, re I really, really appreciated that. Uh, and I think that really, that, that really sums him up. He was just a, a wonderful individual and, and a great man. <laughs>